It's time now for Perspective. My guest today is journalist, author, and academic Linda Kinsler. Her book, Come to the Court and Cry, How the Holocaust Ends, reconciles a deeply personal family history during and after the Second World War with universal themes of collective memory, justice, national identity, and the complex dynamics that sometimes have turned victims into perpetrators. Well, I'd like to get straight into the questions because there's so much to talk about. Linda, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So you have both victims and um, collaborators with the Nazis in, in your family. Can you talk about that and how that weaves into your book and what the personal journey of discovering that, that was like for you? Yeah, so I'm actually joining you from Riga today. Uh, my parents immigrated to the United States uh, from the Soviet Union, from Riga, Latvia, and my mother's family. They were Ukrainian Jewish family. Um, my father's family are Latvians. And on my mother's side, there are several victims of the Holocaust um, who were murdered in Babin Yar, outside of Kiev in Ukraine, which was actually just bombed in the first week of the Russian full-scale invasion. Um, and on my father's side, um, my grandfather was a collaborator with the Nazis, with the occupying German forces here in Latvia during World War II. Along with your grandfather, Linda, there are two other important protagonists in your book, Victor's Arash and Herbert's Sukers. Without giving too much away for those uh, who haven't read your fantastic book yet, who are they and how are they connected to your grandfather? Well, these were all the men who made up what was called the Arais Commando, which was the most brutal killing unit of the Holocaust in Latvia it was what is called the Holocaust by bullets. It was this kind of Holocaust that preceded the gas chambers, the kind of paradigmatic imagery of the concentration camps that we are all familiar with. This was a much more local atrocity. The victims saw the men who were killing them before they were brought to their deaths. Um, and Victor Zares was the leader of this unit, and Herbert Zuckers was one of the men that uh, was under his command. And Zuckers is famous, and he is the subject of my book because he became the only Nazi whom Mossad is known to have assassinated. They murdered him in 1965, and my book emerges from my discovery of a posthumous criminal investigation into his collaboration in the Holocaust. And I discovered that the evidence that there is a lot of evidence that speaks to his role in the atrocities, and it was slowly being undone because now we are so far away from the crime, and it's so easy in a legal forum to just say, no, this proof does not suffice. And that lends itself very easily to various forms of revisionism and denialism. And the object that those Mossad agents left on his body carries symbolic importance uh, throughout the book. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how it influenced the title of your book? Absolutely. I was really struck when I discovered that on the body of Zuckers, they left an excerpt of the closing speech of Sir Hartley Shawcross at the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. And that particular speech, I'm not sure that the general public is aware of the extent to which the Holocaust in Eastern Europe was consisted of so much of the evidence that was levied at the IMT, because that was simply what was available at the time. You know, the protocols of the Wannsee conference were not, had not yet been discovered. And so a lot of it focused on the crimes that were perpetrated um, in what we now think of as the former Soviet Union. And Shawcross emphasized in his speech how that local Holocaust was carried out. And he ended it with an appeal to the judges. He said, imagine that all of humanity is in front of you, that humanity is, humanity is here, that it comes to this court and cries, these are our laws, let them prevail. And so that is where the title of the book comes from. And so why the subtitle, How the Holocaust Ends? Yes, I understand that it's a little bit um, opaque. It does require explanation. And I say in the book, it's not a prediction and it's not a prescription. It's a warning. And it's this observation that now we are in this moment, which we have known has been coming for a very long time, when the Holocaust has slipped out of living memory, when the few survivors that are alive, you know, they often cannot be brought to court to stand as witnesses, which is extremely important in legal forums. And so we have a problem where we're relying on history to tell about tell us about this very important, critical and unforgettable era. And yet we still insist on bringing cases from this era to court. And so 
I'm trying to point out that we ha we're inhabiting this very strange moment and we have yet to understand what is at stake. And I think that is, especially with the war going on in Ukraine right now, we have so much ample evidence to see how easily it can be maligned. A part of your book, Linda, also uh, explores the possibility that your grandfather worked as a double agent uh, for the Soviets. Uh, what do you think his involvement in one or perhaps both of these regimes says about what one of the scholars quoted in your books uh, describes as the choiceless choices that so many people faced during the war? Yeah, so my grandfather survived the war, and he we have evidence that he was on, in the employ of the Soviet security services afterwards. Um, it was the NKVD, it was the predecessor to what we now think of as the KGB. Um, that, and we su suspect that his role was to identify the men who were collaborating with the Germans. He would have been familiar with all of them, having worked with them during that period. And I think it's really a paradigmatic story because you realize during this period that a lot of people didn't, you know, it's not an excuse. You cannot pardon it. You can never excuse what they did, but you understand more about the complexity of the situation that they found themselves in. Um, they might not have understood what work they were being signed up for, although they clearly stayed on once they it became very clear. Um, and I think what you see, particularly in this region, is that there's still a lot to be reckoned with, with those overlapping um, I don't know, I don't want to say allegiances, but certainly roles. And those only began to be brought to light after 1991. So we think a lot about memory work and the historical kind of um, studies that still need to be brought to light. And that has been really happening over the last 20 years. And so that is kind of what I wanted to highlight, just to think about the different roles that people inhabited and not to think of them in such black and white terms, because it does, it's so important to understand the role of the perpetrator, the mind of the perpetrator, and thinking about the different ways they could have thought is extremely important, as we know from great works like Christopher Browning. Um, and the themes of your book, as you, you kind of have mentioned, are all the more pertinent as Europe is, of course, grappling with, with warfare again and in some of the very places that you, that you discuss in your book. The question of memory and the purpose that it theoretically serves uh, in preventing the repetition of, of history uh, is, is, again, all the more relevant. Do you think that history repeats itself because forgetting is the norm? Or do you think that the remembrance efforts uh, marking these atrocities during the Second World War have been insufficient? I wouldn't say they've been insufficient, um, and I don't think that history repeats. I don't think that what we're seeing right now is by any means a re repetition of history. I do think we're seeing how easily it can be um, manipulated and how powerful it is to bring up these old historical tropes, which through this really robust memory culture that we have developed all around the world are very familiar and can be easily mobilized to nefarious ends, as we're seeing Russia justifying its full-scale invasion of Ukraine by saying they're um, purportedly claiming to liberate Ukraine from what they say falsely is a kind of neo-Nazi regime. Um, and these statements can be attached to the memory of what the Russians call the Great Patriotic War because that mythology is so strong. So I don't think that it's a problem with memory. I think it's more about how we've embraced this memorial culture. And we, I think we really need to reckon at this particular moment with what we want it to do, how we want it to act in our societies, and not to, not to take memory as something that is an answer in and of itself, that does its own work that we don't need to pay attention to. You know, it's not enough just to collect a testimony and put it on a shelf. You need to still kind of work with it. You need to understand what it means. Linda Kinsler, author of Come to the Court and Cry How the Holocaust Ends. Thank you so much for your time, for coming on France 24 today. That's unfortunately all we have time for. Thank you so much.